Okay, so this is a redux of the wound care lecture that we did on Wednesday. Unfortunately, the previous lecture had gotten corrupted or something happened to the data. So this is a redux of that data. I'm going to break it up into a couple parts. I'm going to first of all go over the dressings themselves. And then I'm going to go through and do a full dressing on the wound care model itself. Uh, if there are any questions, please feel free to ask. Send me messages, however you need to do in order to get it. So when we talked about the wound care dressings, a couple of things we talked about was mainly A, there being a primary dressing, and B, there being a secondary dressing. The pri primary dressing being the one dressing that is actually in the wound itself that protects the wound and promotes the healing inside the wound bed itself. The secondary dressing being the one that provides the cover and the protection for the over wound area and the peri wound area. So when we're dealing with that, our primary dressing that we deal with on a most common basis, obviously, is just standard gauze. Um, gauze is going to be labeled by its size. So in this case, this is a 4x4 four four gauze pad. Most of the gauze does come in these nice containers, which makes it easy because then when we need to dampen the gauze, we can actually just use saline, standard saline, and put it right in here and it keeps things from getting all messy. Um, there's, so your standard gauze is your traditional type of gauze that you're going to deal with. This is going to be packed in most wounds. This is going to be the filler for most wounds. On top of the standard gauze, obviously, there's impregnated gauze, right? So impregnated gauze, most common, are either Xeroform or um, Adaptac, which is Adaptac here. Impregnated gauze is usually impregnated with petroleum jelly. So that petroleum jelly, then, the job of that is to keep this from sticking to any surface that it would normally stick to. So a good example that would be bone or any type of tendon. So if you have exposed bone, exposed tendon, your normal traditional gauze, right, your normal traditional gauze with its nice fibers and stuff like that tends to stick down to those type of materials. So you need something that will keep it from sticking. So your traditional impregnated gauze is usually what we're going to use. Again, zero forms, uh, Adaptac are your kind of most common forms, but there are all kinds of them out there. Cured makes one. There's all kinds of them out there. In addition to those, obviously you have every other type of dressing you possibly have, right? So we just, here we have a non-adherent pad. A lot of times these pads are gonna see across the front of a knee pad, a knee surgery. And again, this is just non-adherent because the knee's gonna have staples in it and they don't want the gauze sticking to the staples. This will keep the gauze from sticking to the staples. Um, this is just your standard non your standard foam pad, another non-adherent pad, as you can see. Usually your non-adherent pads have this nice shiny texture to it. And then of course your traditional ABD pad, you're going to see a lot in a heavy draining wound. This is a gauze pad surrounded by a protection, but inside it's very, very thick cotton. And that will absorb most anything in a heavy draining wound. Um, but there are other better options than this nowadays. But this was the traditional usage when we had a heavy draining wound. It was just an ABD pad. It's still the cheapest type uh, gauze. And then of course there's gauze stripping, right? So here we have two different types of gauze stripping. The gauze stripping is exactly like it sounds. It's just gauze and strips. What can we use that for? Well, we can use that for packing in, undermining, and tunneling. It comes in your traditional normal gauze and then also ionized gauze for wounds that are infected and things like that. So that's kind of your general primary dressing stuff, not getting into the specialty dressings yet, but that's just your general primary dressings. Getting into your secondary dressings, the most common things you're going to encounter on the floor when you're working with patients is just your standard, everyday, ordinary border gauze, right? And when we think secondary dressings, most of the times what we can think of is just a Band-Aid, right? This looks like an extra large Band-Aid. It's got a little bit of a gauze pad attached to it along with adhesive binding so it can stick to the peri wound area. There are all kinds of them out there. This one's a heel dressing, obviously. There are sacral dressings. There are long, thin dressings that can go down your wounds, such as total knee replacements and things like that. There are smaller ones. There are larger ones. It just depends upon what your needs are. And these here particularly, these gray ones, are silver impregnated. So the point of a lot of silver impregnation and a lot of the materials that we use in wound care is silver is shown to have great antimicrobial and antibacterial effects. It's actually bactericidal. So it can help kill off any of those germs to get in there if your wound is infected. Uh, this is another one that's got a little bit of that silver impregnation in it. Um, 
And then here's some other ones. These are biotains. And biotains, when we talk about the drastic wounds that may be over really heavy bony prominences, a lot of times we're looking more into these. And these are kind of your secondary foam border gauzes. This gauze has a nice thick layer to it, right? It'll allow it to adhere to the wound area, this peri wound area because of the tape. But say you have an injury on something like the lateral malleolus or medial malleolus and the patient is planning on wearing shoes. Well, the shoe might dig in every time they plant down or they're walking. So you might want something with a thicker foam area in order to provide them with a little cushioning, right? Um, this one's by Coloplast. Here's another biotane wound dressing, right? And this provides a nice, thick, protective layer, right? Or maybe you have something on the sacrum where you need a little extra cushioning back there because they've got sacral breakdown and you're worried about any type of further breakdown. You can use foam dressing in order to help with that. Um, other than that, then we go into our kind of other dressings that you're commonly going to see, such as your hydrocolids, right? So your hydrocolids as you can see here, are a little bit thicker than your traditional gauze dressing, right? And what they are is they are a impenetrable barrier from things such as, and here's, this one's kind of really thick, you can see it. They're an impenetrable barrier, so if your patient maybe is incontinent or something to that effect, you could use a hydrocolid barrier over top of your wound, and that will keep any bacteria or anything else out of that area, specifically fluids and breakdown and fecal coliform and all that fun stuff. The downside to these is they also don't allow any breathing. So if you put one of these on, it's gonna block everything out, including the oxygenation of the wound. So be aware of that. Um, but these are great for protecting wounds, especially in areas that are gonna get very wet, very sweaty, uh, or have any type of urine or fecal input on it as well. And then you have your traditional, these are just nothing more than your traditional, uh, commonly heard as tegaderm or film dressings, right? These dressings are perf mostly perfectly clear, and those dressings allow you to lay it over a wound or even a surgical site so that you can actually see what's under, especially when you need to see under types of or the underside of the wound, so you can look into the wound while you're maybe keeping an eye on it, such as if you have a stage one pressure injury. This can go over that stage one pressure injury, and then what that's gonna do is that's gonna create a nice barrier, right? So if we take this off and we apply it, Right, so we're gonna apply a little bit of it. And we apply that down, right? That's gonna create a nice area where it's gonna be friction free, right? So that means that if this was on a sacral area or initial tuberosity or calcaneus or anything like that, that'll provide an area where now that area is, has a nice smooth area rather than have an area of friction, right? And it'll protect that skin keep it from breaking down even further um you also have your clear film dressing which i've talked about and then of course you have your masticals or mat mastisols these are nothing more than liquid bandage right these can be used two ways for small minor cuts and abrasions this can be used almost as a primary dressing itself oftentimes you'll hear this as liquid bandage or the other way this can be used is if you have a dressing such as a primary and a secondary pad that's not sticking down, you can use this mastisole around the edges of the wound and that'll allow these edges to be more adherent, right? So maybe your patient's skin is just, you know, super oily or something to that effect. This stuff can help that other bandage stick a little bit better. So one of the first things we have to determine when we open up a wound, we're gonna open up a wound in the second video, is, is that wound draining heavily is it draining enough or is it draining too little, right? Meaning, does it have a lot of, what's the fluid content of that wound? If it's too heavily draining, that's a problem as well. We want a nice, warm, moist wound environment that is enclosed, but we want, don't want it too moist and we don't want it too little moist, right? We want it right in that nice middle area, just like Goldilocks and the Three Bears, right? It's gotta be just right. If we don't have that just right area, it can cause problems. So what happens if a wound has too moist of an area? Well, if it's too moist, we're gonna to turn to something that's going to absorb it. We can pack it with extra gauze. 
It's absolutely. We used to do wet the dry dress things all the time where we would put dry gauze in there, let it suck up all that fluid and then just pull it off and pull out all that gunk that way. We found that that dries out the wound a little more. It's probably not the best idea. So now when we do put gauze in wounds, usually it's going to be dampened with saline or something of that like. What we can do in addition to that is we can use things like alginates if it's too moist, right? So alginates, these are some examples of alginates, right? These are a common sort of really finely woven material, right? And so a lot of them come from algae or some sort of a bio product, right? These absorb 20 times their weight in size. So we can cut a small piece of this off, right? Such as using something small like this or this, and that can provide most of what we need for a heavily draining wound. These, these absorb so much fluid and they protect it, we can cut them to any size and it'll fit. We don't wanna to put too much in there because if we put too much alginate in, obviously it's gonna dry out the wound bed. So we have to, again, be very careful about how much we put in, but this is gonna suck up all that exudate, all that serous fluid, any type of slough or anything that's gonna be in there, it's gonna get sucked right in towards it. Um, I prefer the alginate to come in stripping like this, just because it's a little easier to cut and a little easier to manage. You can get alginate like this. Alginate comes in rolls like this. So there's any number of ways alginate comes. In addition, just like any other dress in the South there nowadays, they can come in silver. And just be aware that anytime we start talking and adding silver to any dressing, it's going to increase the cost. So you have to be aware of that, right? We don't wanna use silver unless we're told to by the PT or told to by the doctor. We have to have an order for this type of stuff. We don't have it as PTAs. We can't just go, oh, well, I'm gonna use the silver dressing today. No, we need to have the order to do that. Um, if the wound is excessively drainage, we don't necessarily have to go get the PT in order to use the traditional alginate. But in order to use a silver alginate, we would need to get PT approval to do it. And then here's another, this is just Max Absorb AG again, just another silver impregnated dressing. You can see it's just a little bit grayer than your traditional white alginate. All right, so either alginates. We also have our collagen dressings, right? So our collagen dressings are for moderate to heavy drainage, almost very similar to um, your alginates, right? This is a Pure Call Plus dressing here. It's collagen dressing. It will turn itself into a very, very soft, gooey gel after it absorbs the exudate, allowing for easy removal. It often will be used in static wounds or wounds that are stuck in the healing process to kind of facilitate that actual progress towards healing. Uh, again, these absorb a ton of fluid as well, but they turn into this jelly kind of fluid that allows everything to be kind of wiped out when we're cleaning the wound. We can also use something like uh, Iodazorb, right? Iodazorb is a gel, it's a catexomer gel. It helps pull some of that excess fluid up and out. And the nice thing about this one is this one has iodine in it. When it goes in, it goes in one color, and as the iodine wears out, it changes color. And as it changes color, that tells you when it's definitely time to get the dressings changed, right? So this will go in and help kill bacteria, help keep a nice, healthy wound area, right? Can even help to soften some of those areas that might need uh, some debris and stuff like that. But this works as well as well. Um, optifoams, right? Optifoams are just more cushioning. Again, I don't seem to have one sitting here. Optifoams are a thick cushioning material that can be put inside the wound, again, to provide a little bit of extra cushioning. It can be used for moderate to heavy drainage as well, but preferably, obviously, we go to the collagens or the alginates at this point when we need something that's really heavily draining. We have these hydrofera blues as well, so hydrofera blues. The hydrofera blue is a bacteriostatic dressing, right? It pulls the bacteria and any type of infection into it. It's a super powerful anti antibacterial wound dressing. It uses um, PVA and polyurethane foam in combination with uh, two naturally occurring organic pigments, so this blue and this violet. And what it'll do is it will suck all of that into it and it'll swell up. And then what that'll do is that tells you that it's time to remove. Um, they say that this can be yeah, a two to three day dress time period, but again, most wound care places are gonna change dressings every two days. But these come in any size and these can be cut to sizing, right? So if you only need half of this, 
Only use half of it. Don't try to fit something into a wound that's not gonna fit. The ideal goal is if we have a round wound, we wanna take this and fit it to the round wound. If we have a square wound, we'll use the square. If we have a oblong, we may have to use something bigger. But you're gonna cut it to fit the exact size of the wound and it's gonna help draw off that infection. So say you open the wound up and the wound had a foul, real sour odor to it. We knew that it's infected. You can use this dressing to help drain some of that and bacteria and infection out so that we can move on to more traditional style dressings like gauze and maybe even alginates, right? Um, Acticote. So Acticote's a relatively, you know, advanced form of wound dressing, right? This is the Act Acticote Flex. This actually allows it to lay over body area so it fits nice and even. You're gonna see this a lot in burn patients. Um, this is a tech, uh, it's a proprietary silver dressing. They say that this has three to four days wear time, according to the manufacturer. But again, most wound care companies aren't gonna, or wound care areas aren't gonna wait three to four days to change a dressing. But they come in all style, all type styles. This one's a little bit thicker and helps absorb some drainage as well. Um, has extremely low adhesive capabilities, so it's not gonna stick to your wounds. And also, they say that this actually starts doing bacterial sidal type work within 30 minutes. So as soon as you put this on within 30 minutes, it's already starting to kill some of the bacteria in that wound bed. So that's really effective at taking care of that. And again, you have just the standard size and this can be cut to fit wounds as well. So if we only need half of this, we could cut this to fit the wound area, right? So we wanna make sure that these type of stuff, anytime we get into this Acticote, we get into the pure call stuff, we're talking a little bit more money for the patient. So you have to be aware of what your clinic and what your hospital is gonna use for the wound care itself, right? Um, I really like this on burn patients just because it allows me to literally lay that dressing right over the wound area itself and it conforms to it. And then when I put secondary dressing on, it fits right over the wound. So if I had hand burn, I could literally fit this right over the top of the hand and then dress the hand and it's not gonna cause that much of a problem. So we talked about what happens if the wound is too moist. Well, what happens if it's not moist enough? then we need to donate moisture to it, right? So obviously we can donate moisture to a wound bed by adding saline. The saline will eventually get absorbed by the body and the body's gonna see that as just natural water. So what we can add to wound areas is hydrogel. Hydrogel is a petroleum jelly product that will keep the area moist and effective and in an optimal healing environment um, while you're actually treating the wound, right? This can be used, uh, you know, I, I usually put a little bit of this over, even when I'm doing um, the impregnated gauze, I'll put a little bit of this over the wound, the, any exposed bone or tendon just to keep stuff from sticking to it. It'll help just a little bit more. This can also be used in the peri wound area, but a lot of times in the peri wound area, we're gonna use more of a barrier cream. But this donates moisture to the area. There are all kinds of gels out there, right? This is silver absorbed gel, so this is the same thing. This is just a you know hydrogel with silver in it. Um, this can help promote antibacterial and antimicrobial technique, and it also can help promote some of the body's natural olive debridement. So the moister we get the wound, the more it helps prevent or promote that autolytic debridement where the body itself tries to push off the sloth and push off the eschar and get rid of the devitalized tissue, right? Um, and here we have another wound dress. This is just a collagen hydrogel, right? So there's all kinds of them out there. Um, there's also stome adhesive. Stome adhesive is used on the air, the peri area around where you have patient has a colostomy or an ostomy bag. This will be used in to fill in the cracks around the actual opening, the wound opening where the actual stoma bag is coming out because a lot of times that area becomes cracked and dry. Well, if it's cracked and dry, well then that the, the actual bag that goes over the outside doesn't seal very nicely. So this goes in, it can be used on the peri wound area and allows it to make a nice smooth seal over that stoma. So these are really kind of important for patients that have ostomies. And obviously we have things like TheraHoney, right? And we'll talk about the difference between autolytic and enzymatic debridement in a little bit, but these allow for debridement of wounds, right? Here's that barrier protectant I was talking about. Barrier protectants used typically on the outside of the wound bed. Um, so autolytic versus enzymatic debridement, right? Autolytic means using the body's own natural chemicals to debride a wound, right? 
in doing that, we keep the wound moist. If we don't keep the wound moist, it will not autolytically debride the wound. It won't try to force off that devitalized tissue. It'll try to maintain it because as the wound dries out, it's gonna suck everything down back to it. So we've gotta keep that wound area moist. TheraHoney can be used to promote that autolytic debridement, right? TheraHoney is just a natural occurring honey um, that's sterilized for wound care. It works really great on debriding tissue. Um, Meta honey may be another term you hear for it. It uh, really helps with necrotic tissue. So that type of stuff, it doesn't necessarily always remove um, eschar, but you do usually with these and even with Sandhill, you need to have some vitalized tissue there in order to help force off the dev devitalized tissue. So it's not like if you just put this on, it's going to just eat away at everything. You need healthy tissue underneath it in order to work. Uh, we don't have an example of Sandhill here, but Sandhill is a prescription um, anti uh, uh, enzymatic, or it's actually an enzymatic debris in the anti. And Santil goes in and softens. It's often used along necrotic tissue. It literally cleaves it along the collagen barrier, so it actually forces that tissue off and it basically turns it to a mush that can be easily removed. Um, Santil is prescription only, so we can't just use Santil on any patient. You have to have doctor's prescription in order to use it. That also means you have to get it order through the PT to use it on top of that. If we don't have any order in there to use anything like TheraHoney or using Santo, we have to have consult with the PT first. The PT has to give us clearance on what we're going to use on the wound. Um, hydrogel, not so much. If we need to use hydrogel, that's just donating fluid to the area. You still want to advise the PT maybe if you had to use hydrogel in the area, but you don't necessarily need to get a prescription for using hydrogel because it's just a petroleum jelly product. We start adding these where we're starting to, where we're starting to get um, silver in it. Yes, we do have to get clearance from the PT to use it. Um, Santil is specific to the patient because it is gonna be a prescription. So that means if the patient has Santil order for them, that has to have a label on it that is labeled to the patient. You're gonna get the labels from the chart, usually at the nurse's station. You're gonna place that label on that and it's gonna go in the locked medicine cabinet of your wound care cart. It has to be locked up because it is a prescription. It doesn't matter if it's not, you know, a, 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 an opiate or anything like that. Because it is a prescription, it has to be locked up. So then we talk about like the wound care cleansers, right? So all the companies out there will sell you all kinds of fancy wound care cleansers. So we've got a couple samples here. I usually like to get them when I'm going to the different um, seminars and stuff like that. Um, this is Skintegrity, these are TheraWorks Cleanser, um, this is Santa Cleanse, right? I'm not saying these are totally bad, right? But most of these have some form of acid in them in order to help with debridement. I don't like using these on wounds because I don't like putting, like this one has citric acid in it. I don't like putting citric acid in a wound. Imagine you've got a paper cut and you open an orange. Well, that's citric acid. It doesn't feel so great, right? Now, most of the wound bed is gonna be, you know, have not functioning nerves, so it may not bother it all the way, but you get to those edges, it's gonna burn. And it's not always comfortable for the patients, right? You can use these if your clinic uses them, then, hey, if that you're told to use this by the PT, use these by the PT. But traditionally, what I see most wound care therapists, and when I say wound care therapists, PT is specifically using, is just natural saline, right? Um, I like this one here just because it's got a little bit of force to it and it can spray. Um, this is just your traditional little sodium chloride saline bottle. Uh, most hospitals have these. Even just getting something as simple as a saline bag from storage, that'll work as well. But this just helps clean the wound out. We're going to see when we actually clean the wound how we use this to clean the wound. But I'm going to use this just like anything else. You're going to use it to wipe out any excess gunk that's in the wound and it also help donate moisture to that wound. So that wound is nice and moist and prepared for dressing. Um, I prefer, again, using just the simple saline, but again, if your clinic uses this, this is not necessarily bad. Um, this one says that it's totally body safe, low pH, non-cytotoxic, right? But then you go down here and it's got a bunch of stuff, and this one's got colloidal silver in it, so it's got some antibacterial, but this one again has um, here it goes, citrus grandis, grapefruit juice extract. So I don't know that I wanna put citric acid into a wound. Um, but again, that's up to your clinic. If your clinic uses it, go ahead and use it. 
Um, this is a broad spectrum hygiene treatment. What is this one? This is a barrier system hygiene treatment. The skin integrity, what does skin integrity have in it? It says, the, again, anytime it says loosen and removes protein and wound debris, that usually means it's got some form of an acid in it. Uh, sorbitol acid, there it is, lactic acid. So it's got two, at least two forms of acid in it. So you wanna be careful when you're treating the wound area. So when you're getting this stuff from the supply cabinet, right? So most hospitals are gonna have a supply cabinet on every floor or supply closet on every floor. Um, unless your clinic has a dedicated wound care cart. And you still may need to fill up that wound care cart from the supply closet, right? So just be, understand your hospital standard procedures. If you don't have a dedicated wound care cart, what you're probably gonna have to do is go to the supply cabinet on the floor and get what you need. You wanna make sure you know what you need before you leave that room. Because every time you leave the patient's room and come back, you're gonna have to wash your hands, foam in, foam out, all that jazz again, put new gloves on. You can't just foam in, oh, I forgot this, go out and get the stuff and start all over again. You wanna make sure you have everything you need when you go into that patient's room. So most hospitals, like I said, will have a supply cabinet. In that supply cabinet, there's usually one of those little handheld scanners like you see at Walmart. And then there's gonna be a wall of stickers with barcodes on them. You're going to pick the barcode of your patient. You're gonna scan that barcode. And then you're gonna go down the line and scan what you're taking out of that closet. All that stuff has to be accounted for. Anything that's not accounted for can be lost in waste, and we don't want to do that. That cuts down on our, our operating costs. We want to make sure that we are using what we need, right? If you don't use all of something, label it for a patient and use it later. But don't just grab everything, go in there and go, oh, well, I think I'm going to use this and this and this and this. Know what you need. That's why it's kind of important and may be useful when you're writing your soap note to place what you used previously in the soap note so that you can get the same stuff the next time you go in. Um, once you have that all scanned in, then you're going to take all that and you're going to go to the patient's room. Understand, once you cross the threshold to that room, that's where you're at the point where if you go outside of that again, you've got to wash and scrub all over again. And that can be time consuming. And in wound care, we want to get through as many of them as possible in the day so we make sure that everyone's taken care of. Any day that we skip on wound care promotes an unhealthy environment in that wound. So we need to make sure that while we're taking care of these patients, we're also taking care of our supplies and taking care of ourselves, right? Um, standard precautions apply. We're going to use the clean technique most times when we do wound care, right? Clean technique means we're going to foam in, we're going to wash, we're going to wear gloves. Um, a lot of times you may wear a mask if you're cleaning out the wound area or using something like a pulse lavage where fluid can fly back up at you. Um, you don't necessarily have to wear a gown unless patients on contact precautions. It's up to you. If you know that the wound is gonna get messy and you need to wear a gown, wear a gown. But inform the patient why they're wearing a gown, you're wearing a gown because that can get a little bit uncomfortable. If you're coming in, you're the only person wearing a gown, the patient wants to know why you're wearing a gown. So be upfront with your patient, right? When you go into the room, tell them you're there to do wound care and that's what you're here to take care of. Make sure that when you do the wound care, you time their pain medication around 20 to 30 minutes before you come in to do wound care. Ideally, 40 minutes would be perfect. You want them to be at that peak efficiency of their pain meds so that when you go in and start digging around in that wound, it doesn't hurt them as much. That leads to a more compliant patient with wound care. If we're constantly going in when they're non-medicated, they're gonna become uncompliant, right? Which means they're gonna start refusing treatment and when they start refusing treatment, that area breaks down and that wound gets worse. If a wound gets worse in a hospital, oftentimes it is on the hospital to pay for that. So our job when we're doing wound care is to make sure that wound is constantly progressing or getting better, right? When patients come into the ER, come into the hospital itself, a lot of times they're gonna be screened for wounds. They're gonna be checked all over to make sure they don't have any pressure injuries, they don't have any cuts, scrapes, abrasions, anything like that because that's gotta be documented. And if it's documented, it can be treated. If it's not documented, then we have no way of showing if that wound occurred outside the hospital or inside the hospital. So we have to be aware of that. We have to make sure that we're protecting the hospital, protecting the patient, right? And we need to indicate, if we see a new wound, we need to report it, right? First, obviously, we'll be report to the nursing staff of that patient, hey, you know, John's got a new wound here. Make sure you report it. Make sure it's documented. Make sure you tell your PT. 
because anytime we have a new wound development, that can cause that can be a progression in a patient's case, and we need to understand what's going on with those patients. That's it primarily for oh uh, the only other one I forgot. I'm sorry, I forgot about this one. This is tender wet. Um, tender wet is actually a hydrogel impregnated gauze. You can use this obviously for a too dry of a wound. So I totally forgot about the tender wet, but it's there. Um, but that's it for the dressings themselves. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get set up and we're going to look at a patient that's already got a dressed wound. We're going to set up to take care of that wound and then we're going to dress the wound. Okay, I'll see you in a bit.